Now, how do I find a good camp spot? What's important to me having done this for 10 years? Everybody does it different. Everybody has things that are important to them that may not be important to me or vice versa. What I care about is I don't want to bother anybody. I don't want anybody bothering me. I don't want to scare the local neighbors and I don't want people coming through my camp all the time. Like the less traffic I have at my camp, the better. That's how I like to do it. Hey everybody, Jamie here. And in this video, I'm going to talk about how I find camping, living the nomadic, the traveling lifestyle. Before I start, I want to show you where I am. So let's do a little panoramic pan here. Not a bad camp spot if you ask me. We're a little more out in the open than I usually like to be, but it's working for us and I dig it, I dig it. So let's get into what I look for when I'm looking for a camp spot. Worked out well for me. You guys might have different criteria, but let's just get into it. The very first thing that I look at is what's the temperature gonna be like. So it depends on the time of year and the elevation of the place. And typically the way I'll structure camping is it's it's by the year. You get down to the warmer places in the winter time, and then as the temperatures warm up, more of the area opens up to you. And so you kind of sit down, in my case, I'll uh, sit down with Becca, or if you're by yourself, whatever, and you come up with a plan of, where do you think you want to go this year? Well, we did the mountains over in... Damn it. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Come on over, man. Well, we did the mountains of Colorado last year. Why don't we go to the Pacific Northwest this year? So let's pick a route that kind of gets us up that way and back down. I don't like to zip back and forth because the bus uses a lot of fuel. So I like to pick a place and kind of do positive miles towards the ultimate destination or at least go to that place and stay in that area for a while. Now, Staying in that area for a while means that we have to remain in compliance. This is mostly going to be about public land. So it's usually 14 days, whether it's BLM land or uh, National Forest land. Sometimes it's not, though. I was in governor's camp a few years ago, and it was 16 days for the year. So you want to make sure you check all those places and make sure if you're going to pay the freight to get to governor's camp, you stay your 16 days. Well, is there other camping reasonably close by? So you didn't uh, come up with that big fuel bill for 16 days. So just something to think through before you begin your trek, where are you going to go for the year? Then I look at what are you going to do when you get there? Is there going to be hiking? mountain biking, in my case, dirt biking, just fun stuff to see. You know, you wanna make sure that you're going someplace, you'll do the Mighty Five, I highly recommend Utah's Mighty Five. We're talking uh, Bryce Canyon, Zion, uh, Canyonland, Moab, that's four of the five, Reef, Capital Reef, there you have it. That's a great, if you pick your times and watch how the weather's gonna be, that's a great year, I would highly recommend. But we need to know where the camping is, man. We're talking about the camping. So how do we find the camping? All right, this is what we do. Get as much recon as you can from as many sources as you can. I like to use friends of mine that have been places. I draw back on my own experience of being places. And I use freecampsites.net, which is a website iOverlander, which is an app, and I use Avenza, which is an app you can download, and it has motor vehicle use maps on it. It has national forests and BLM land on it, Bureau of Land Management land on it, all mapped out. It's what the rangers use. And so if you're gonna have a conversation with a ranger where you're parked, what would you rather have at your disposal if you're, if you're discussing your camp spot? Would you rather have an app that you downloaded? It might be using an API key from one of those places, but would you rather have the same map that they use with the motor vehicle use map on it and they shade areas where there's no camping? It changes from year to year. So be aware of that. So you start with your freecampsites.net and iOverlander and those are social aggregated camp spots. It gives you an idea where there's camping but it's nothing carved in stone and things change from year to year. There's a lot of places where I'll go where they had camping 
last year, two years ago, whatever, and now there's signs up that say no camping. So you wanna make sure that your information is current, and at the very least, if you get there and there is no camping, you're not so far away from other places that you'd like to be that have camping. So I use those three things. Let's talk about no camping, no camping signs. You're gonna see them everywhere. Uh, at the beginning of trailheads, at the beginning of uh, forest roads, you're gonna see no camping signs. It doesn't necessarily mean there's no camping in the area. It just means right where that sign is, there's no camping. If you fall back on your motor, ve motor vehicle use map, that you can get off of the National Forest and BLM websites. You can download the app and download the maps on your phone. They're a couple of dollars, a lot of them are free. You can see where the shaded areas are of no camping and it'll have the little order that was written up by the person in charge and it'll have all the details of it. I like to print those out, I have a printer. I like to print out where I am if I'm gonna be there for a couple of weeks and sync the location of where I've decided to camp with the GPS on my phone to see that it's clearly not in the no camping area. Oftentimes, there'll be a road just dividing where there's camping and where there's no camping. And if you're on the right side of the road, you're good. If you're on the left side, you gotta move. You also want your campsites to meet your criteria. So let's talk about what my criteria is. For me, when I'm looking for a campsite, uh, where I'm gonna post up for a couple of weeks or in the area for maybe even longer. I wanna make sure that there's a package store that I can get mail. I wanna make sure I have access to drinking water. And you can do supply runs at a grocery store that's uh, not taking your head off in, in the pricing because you're in a tourist town. One of the things I'll do sometimes is load up with groceries, a couple of weeks worth of groceries, as much as I can handle before I get to a place such as Bryce Canyon. Because if you get up to the Bryce Canyon grocery store, the prices are going to be much different. So that's one of the things you look at. Let's talk about getting mail on the road. Post office vary on whether or not they will accept packages from other companies besides USPS. So that's gonna vary and you're gonna have to check with them individually. Some will, will take packages for free from FedEx, DHL, and UPS, and some will charge a $5 per package and some will have nothing to do with it. That's just something to think about. Now, in today's age, the way this is 2022 when I'm putting this out, the way things are going, you've got CVS taking UPS as an access point. You've got Amazon lockers that are getting more common in more places, and they're just going to continue to get more common. I think Whole Foods in Sedona had a uh, Dropbox. So I remember being in Sedona five years ago and there was one place and they wanted $10 a package, which seemed a little steep to me, but you'll pay it if it's if you need it bad enough. So you gotta be a little wily, but you can usually get packages just about anywhere if you're willing to do a little bit of research and find out what you can access and what you can't. And also be patient because a lot of these places, you, some of them are just like right on top of their business and they got your package and it, it all works out. And then there's other places where you know your package is delivered because you see the, the delivery on your phone and they're saying, we don't have it. Well, they probably just haven't gone through their packages yet. And these small towns, you just gotta be patient. It's all good. All right, so with that, let me talk about, now let me talk about something else that's just another nuanced level to finding good camping that I want you to know about from my experience. And that is, we do not necessarily want to find the best camp spot with the best vista when we go someplace, especially if we're going to be there for a couple of weeks, and I'll tell you why. When I first started doing this, I was in probably my first year or two. I went on this really rough, kind of four wheel drive only, high clearance road, way back on this Mesa in Zion. It was uh, Smithsonian Butte and found a great camp spot. Had a van, a high clearance, all wheel drive van with big tires on it. And it was amazing. In fact, the view that we had was the view that you'll see on a screensaver on a MacBook laptop. That's how amazing this view is. It's It's got to be among the best views or they wouldn't have chose it. You know how they do on those screensavers. So we post, it's free camping. We post up. I think we got it made. 
Next thing you know, a Jeep tour comes through. Next thing you know, another Jeep tour comes through. And I don't want to make this video about this, but this has happened in more than one location. These Jeep tours, they're not super friendly. The, it, I get the impression, you know, some are friendly. I shouldn't say that. I might, I might not even leave that in because I'm going down a rabbit hole. I don't think I want to go into. But anyway, a Jeep tour came in. And there's people walking right in the center of our camp. They're not really observing any kind of, uh, what do you call it? Personal space. And this just keeps happening. And it was free camping and we were in the right to camp there. But learn from my doing that, if you want to call it a mistake, I don't do that anymore because there was a, a very acceptable place around the bend, maybe another 75, 100 yards that they the tour wasn't going that I could have camped. And I could have walked over there while I was eating a piece of beef jerky and saw that. I mean, I, you can see the spot from where anywhere on that little knoll. So if it's a really good spot, that's happened to me twice, by the way. It's not just the one in Zion. If it's a really good spot and you kind of figure it out, because you won't figure it out right away. You look for tire tracks on the roads, if it's a well-beaten path, that kind of gives you a hint. But also, if you, you know, what happened with me is it was subtle. A Jeep tour comes. Another Jeep tour comes. A Jeep tour comes and stops right where I'm at. And so, it was a subtle thing, but then I started figuring out, oh wait, look at how beautiful this vista is, and other people don't have access to this unless they're parked right here in this spot. So, I kind of figured that out. So I would recommend if you want peace and quiet, kind of like I do, but you still want, there's some really good spots you can get. You don't have to be right up on the, the best perch of the whole area. So keep that in mind. Use your motor vehicle use map. Use the apps that you have at your disposal and you're going to be fine and have a good time. All right. Hope you got something out of this. See you on the next upload. See ya.